Hello and welcome to The Big Fight and this is a rather rare occasion on The Big Fight at least for the last one month because after weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks this is the first Big Fight that we are actually not discussing demonetization. Yeah, you, got, you heard that right. We're not talking about demonetization for one. This is actually a big fight that we've been hoping to do ever since that big victory of Donald Trump in America. And it really asks a question about where 2016 is leaving the world. Is this going to be remembered as the year when the basic ideas of liberal democracy, a sort of a liberal consensus that came about after the Second World War and continued to develop, this is what democracy should be, this is the way discourse should be, this is what politics should be, this is what government should be, and by and large it was a liberal consensus, both in the government and certainly among the media. So is 2016 going to be remembered as the year when that started to totter, if not actually get dethroned, certainly the year when that started to totter. And we've got some really, really great guests to help us uh, discuss this and analyze this, both in the Indian context, but also in the global context in the light of all that's been happening, because some of the biggest events, obviously the victory of Donald Trump, uh, Brexit and other such developments have been taking place outside our shores and, and away from us. So joining us in the program, Shashi Tharoor is going to be starting off and helping us get some of the, he's a, he's a historian, not he's here actually as much in his capacity as an author and historian as in his capacity as a Congress uh, uh, spokesperson. So he will help us get an overall framework to discuss this in. As indeed with Aditya Mukherjee, well-known historian, uh, it's great to, great to have you with us. Franz Agothias, political writer and journalist, has also served as the South Asian correspondent for Le Figaro. Great to have you with us. Uh, Jan Ross is the South Asia Bureau Chief of the German weekly, Die Zeit. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Tariq Fateh, Canadian author, one of those who believes that liberalism has already gone way too far and it's about time that the liberal elite were brought down to earth or you know something like that, I guess, Tariq, I'm sure you will, you will say when we actually come to you. Uh, Mehir Sharma, columnist and author, it's great to have you with us. And A.B. Kasbin, South Asia Bureau Chief of the Financial Times. Thank you all so much for being with us. Now, before I kick off with all of my panelists uh, here in, in the studio, let's try and set the stage a little bit. And Shashi Tharoor, if you look at the example of the way the world has been going, Brexit, you know, the victory of Donald Trump, Trump, there is an indication that perhaps we are heading for a more illiberal era than we have been used to. Would you agree with that basic theory, that liberal democracy as we know it might be starting to totter? Liberal democracy in sort of the Fukuyama thesis that we've reached the end of history and there is only one outcome and it's a triumph of liberal capitalism and liberal democracy, that was discredited already soon after it was propounded because around the world we saw the rise of ethnic nationalism, we saw the rise of Islamist jihadism, we saw all sorts of factors coming up that Fukuyama had not bargained for and one could argue therefore that history far from ending had simply changed into something that was prepared to show that, it's, uh, that reports of its demise were exaggerated. But liberal democracy in the sense of a way of resolving disputes, of actually voting for uh, uh, political outcomes, of consulting all sections of citizenry, in a sense you could argue that that has not only not ended but that even the victories of these illiberal politicians like Mr. Trump are actually an affirmation of the survival of liberal democracy institutionally because it's liberal democracy that has created the culture, the political culture, that has made it possible for people of such contrarian views to actually triumph. So, you know, Shashi, there are some people who would ask, and of course others would say, well, this is exactly a liberal elite media way of looking at it. But there are some people who will ask, hey, look what Britain did, they voted for Brexit, it's bad for the country, look what Colombia did, look what X country did, look what Y country did, look what the United States did voting in, in Donald Trump. So uh, there are some who are saying, is democracy still working now or has it become too easy to, to pander to a certain you know, sort of emotion and get, get elected that way? Uh, in, in a country like China, would people be saying, well, you know, democracy perhaps not quite the right way anymore? No, fair enough, and yet one could turn around and say, what does democracy claim? It claims to be government of the people, by the people, for the people. And if democracy, therefore, uh, is a method in which people get their preferences uh, into, uh, transformed into government policy, then who, is, who are we to sit and say that Brexit is bad for Britain or that Trump is bad for America? 
After all, the people of Britain constitute what Britain is. The people of America constitute what America is. And they have decided that this is what is good for them. Now, it may be that they will regret that choice. But the whole point about democracy is that people have a right to make a mistake. And you and I may agree, Vikram, that, uh, that, that, that Brexit would actually be disastrous for Britain. But at the same time, the British people as a majority want it. And today, even though their Supreme Court has ruled that the parliament will have to vote on Brexit, my understanding is that a majority of MPs are going to put their personal preferences aside and go along with what their voters have indicated they want through the referendum. They feel it would be wrong for an MP to exercise his educated elite preference over that of the perhaps ignorant, perhaps prejudiced preference of his own voters. One of the theories that is actually emerging, and I'm going to put this to the panel as well, is that a lot of what is happening is actually the result of a backlash. Uh, it was called, I think, a white clash during the uh, American elections, but a backlash against immigration, a backlash against different cultures coming in, a backlash against you know, Muslims in some areas, a backlash against the gay community. In this world, in 2017, in a time when you can actually listen to a different variety of views than just the pure media, uh, is it that all that we are seeing is a reaction in some ways against a changing world? Yeah, you know, actually people do nurture a lot of bigotry and prejudice in every society, including ours. And we had always assumed that it was the job of civilized politics to leave certain things unsaid. Um, I remember the horror with which I heard some of the discourse that arose in our country in the late 1980s during the Ram Janmabhoomi agitation. Because people were saying things on public platforms that when I was growing up in India would have been considered impolite to even express in your living room. So suddenly prejudices that people sort of darkly muttered to very trusted friends were now out in the open and being expressed. To my mind that is worrying but it is that sort of dumbing down of discourses happened everywhere and one could argue that in a perverse way it is actually democracy at work because people, the ordinary people who after all are constitutive of democracy are given a chance to express what they really feel. Maybe, therefore, society has to try and educate them to be more liberal. But the problem there, again, is that liberalism has become associated in people's imaginations with elitism. Why was Hillary Clinton defeated? Not because she was a liberal per se, but because she was identified with the liberal elite. This is the Wall Street establishment. Obviously, Trump is far richer than she is, has led a far more elite lifestyle than she has, but he somehow succeeded in identifying with the prejudices and grouses of the common person, whereas Hillary was making speeches to Wall Street companies and saying to her um, plutocratic supporters that she had to say things uh, publicly that she didn't mean privately. And all of that obviously hurt her a great deal. In India, people like you and me conversing in English are dismissed as Macaulay Putras by the kind of people who felt that Mr. Modi's party represents a more authentic form of Indianness. Now, I argue that I am as authentic as they are and you are as authentic as, as uh, an unnamed she is. But the fact is that truthfully, uh, uh, this has become uh, a ground for dispute. So if you look around the world, you've got Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, who is leading in the polls. You've got Marine Le Pen in France, who's leading in the polls. You've got right-wing groups in Hungary and in Austria right now in the repoll just later this week on the 4th of December this weekend. There is a far-right leader of a neo-Nazi party that is poised to triumph in the presidential elections. Now, what does all this mean? At one level, of course, it's frightening. But at another level, it suggests that what used to be impolite to express is being brushed under the carpet. And so the arm army of those countries, the, the un relatively undereducated common man, is finally getting his point of view up in front. And he may discover that he was wrong, as many of these Aam Aadmi discovered with their support for fascism in, in the 30s. But the truth is that um, the rest of the world doesn't want to pay a terrible price for these people discovering they were wrong. Another thing that has been associated with elitism now is, of course, the media. And if you are seeing in country after country when the leaders take over, look what Donald Trump is doing right now. It's an absolute war, it seems, bet uh, bet between him and the media in general. You know, almost daily tweets are coming out 
from him as president-elect attacking the media. And this you're picking up on social media and things like that, that the media in some way is a liberal media, it's an elitist media, it's out of sync with a lot of what the people out there actually believe. Would you agree with that? And also, are we seeing different echo chambers right now which are being set up? So you will have illiberal echo chambers and they believe that they have the right on what is the truth and that the media is therefore, you know, in some way, a paid media and is, is biased against whoever it is. You see, that is true in that when we speak about the liberalism being associated with the elite, the media gets conflated with both, both with liberalism and with elitism. And the media is seen as a sort of propagator of a point of view which um, uh, comes out of a rarefied intellectual environment buttressed by social privilege that most people distance themselves from. Now, if that was true, and I think it was certainly contested territory in India where we had left-wing journalists in the mainstream establishment as well, but we can go to that separately, left and right were all represented in our country's voices. Nonetheless, I would argue that modern television has moved away from that liberal stereotype because in their desire to pander to the lowest common denominator, to get their breaking news TRPs, to declaim that the nation wants to know and to shout <laughs> until the nation no longer gets to hear. Yeah. These people have actually moved yeah. away from liberal elitism to a kind okay. of almost uh, gutter journalism that has in many ways taken over the public discourse. Right. Shashi, on I have media. absolutely no idea so who you're referring to. Or... I think arguably what you're talking about. Well, I'm not referring to individuals, but to a certain stripe, a certain, I must admit, contemptible stripe, which is which has dominated in many of our channels, and not only in English, by the way. I know you're thinking of some English journalists, but there are also equivalents <laughs> of those in other language media in our country. And therefore, I would argue that liberalism and elitism are no longer right. the hallmarks of this kind of media. A lot of this media is populist, is, is, is low level, and caters to the lowest common denominator in terms of people's knowledge levels, awareness, levels of tolerance, and indeed prejudice and bigotry. So okay. if that is something that we have actually seen in our own media, it's not very different elsewhere. I mean, Fox News right. is not very different from Times Now and so on. Okay. The fact is that Fine. in this world, you've got this kind of media available. I think it's far too easy All right. to caricature the entire media as being liberal and religious, the entire uh, liberal community as, as representing privilege. All right, Shachi. All of this has actually undermined the contest of ideas this ought to be about. Shachi, thanks a lot for joining us and helping us get some perspective on, on, this, on this entire issue. And that really sets the stage for some of what we can perhaps uh, you know, talk about out here. A crisis of liberal democracy, is, is that what we are seeing? And Amy, perhaps I can start with you and maybe get you to explain the voting patterns of, what is it, 60 million Americans who took a particular decision that you may not have entirely agreed with? Um, well, first of all, I think it's important to remember that in the American system, there's a difference between the popular vote and the electoral college. So um, Hillary Clinton, um, the Democratic candidate, did in fact win the popular vote. Um, not according to Donald Trump. He says there was fraud. He says it was all rigged. First no time in my life, by the way, I've ever heard the winner of an election saying that this was a rigged election. Um, there was voter fraud. I think Donald Trump... What, what Hillary Clinton should be saying is that let's have the entire election again. If you really believe it was rigged, let's, let's do it again. Come on, let's go vote. It's important to remember that, like, in the U.S., really, you did see huge geographic and regional disparities between um, more prosperous places on the coast and places that have been hard hit economically by the changes that we've seen in globalization. I still don't think it's a total crisis in liberal democracy um, I think in some ways I would have been more concerned if I think the fact that everybody, you know, generally accepts that the results of the election, I've seen, I've, I've been in countries, um, in Thailand, for example, where democracy has been systematically undermined um, by one side, which doesn't accept the legitimacy of the elected leader and mobilizes continuously. And this is so alarming. So, um, so you seem to be saying what Shashi was saying also, that while people are continuing to accept the principle that you can elect whom you want, even if the person who gets elected is not somebody the liberal elite necessarily want, democracy is still in good hands and is safe and sound. You may not agree with what the choices are that the people throw up, but the fact that people are throwing it up is enough. 
Yeah, I mean, I am slightly worried about the steps that um, a President Trump might take to undermine the kind of institutional systems and checks and balances that are there um, and that have been there in the U.S. But I would almost be more alarmed and think it was a bigger crisis if, for example, Trump had lost, Hillary Clinton had won, and Trump started mobilizing all the people who, you know, had voted for him, who saw themselves on the losing side and really started to undermine um, okay. public confidence in the legitimacy of the electoral system. Okay. That no. would be a massive crisis. <laughs> okay, Mihir. I think the idea that there is in a, a notion of liberal democracy that is, pure, that is pure and acceptable and that we should all be striving towards, uh, whichever country we're in, that is more under threat than most things. I mean, um, you may claim and you may hope that the United States will survive Donald Trump. Trump I'm sure it will. But aspects of the institutions will be forever sullied. And many people in the, in, in the U.S. won't care. In fact, there, there are some startling numbers that are coming up that compare younger people in the West today with younger people, um, with people of the equivalent generation 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, 80 or 85 percent of, of younger people in the West uh, believed that they had that, that living in a democracy was essential, and that number has gone down by 20 to 25 percentage points today. So there is a lack of belief in the system that is leading to the election of these people, which okay. is then in turn um, uh, stressing the system and further weakening it. So there's this right. terrible um, uh, downward spiral. Well, signs of that liberal elitism are visible right here. It's Hillary Clinton's supporters who came out in large numbers to dis. Uh, disrespect the decision of the people of America. I mean, they protested and, uh, on the no, streets. No, no, just a second. Let, let me, let me, let me, you asked a question, sir. So the notion that a problem would happen if Trump would lose and let loose his hordes onto the streets. Actually, it's the opposite. It's Clinton who lost and let loose her hordes on the street. And coming to liberal democracy, let me assure you that this is the beginning of liberal democracy. It is the slow death of identity politics that entered into our electoral systems after the Cold War ended, and where everyone and his uncle was placed into an ethnic or uh, garbage and vote. Banks were created and issued. Can I just take you up on that for a second, if you don't mind? You're saying it's the end of identity politics. Yes. Now, there is some who would say that everything that we are seeing right now is still an aspect of identity politics. What happened in the US, what's happening in other countries, is because a certain section of the population yes. does not want immigrants, does not want people of a different no, actually, color. Let me, they don't want non-whites. Let me answer and that. certainly no more Muslims. Sure, so that's, they want that's jobs. That's one aspect of it. So Michigan wants jobs. And for working class white men to vote on an issue of getting jobs that have been shipped off to Mexico or China, or for that matter, India or Sri Lanka, or wherever, is that, are you suggesting that their desire to get jobs back and for the first time working class Americans have not voted for a corrupt Democratic Party where the presidential candidate was on the, the gift line of the Saudis, where she voted for a death of a million people in the Iraq war, and yet... Okay, we don't have to retry the American election. But right you now. are. It's over you you are trying, sir. No, no, I'm asking, I'm asking about a broader subject. That in, I'm not just talking about America. It's happening in other countries as well. It's happening but let in me Europe. come to India. It's I think, the, it's I, I think it is the first time liberal democracy has come up where identity politics is suffering immensely. And okay. if you don't want to hear that, if that is an unpleasant truth, then that's why people have a distrust of liberal media. Because the moment you come up the with an answer... The media has called you here to debate this. That's the reason we want your voice. We're trying to hear it. That's well, what we've called you here. Well, you're trying to stuff my voice out. That's what I'm saying. Please go ahead. I, uh, how much I to stop your voice? Because you're now? not letting me finish what I'm saying. I, okay, finish what you're saying. That when you self-declare liberal democracy's death simply because the British people rejected what every political party said and voted for Brexit, or that in France, uh, Sarkozy goes down and a different center-right politician comes up on the very basis of what is the French identity. Then why is it that the French people, desiring the, uh, the principles of the French Republic and the French Revolution, are considered illiberal if they stand up for a revolution that gave us democracy right around the world? Okay, fair enough.